Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as we always do as we start the season of Lent, we're going back to Jesus tempted in the wilderness uh, this year in Luke chapter 4. Today we'll be focusing particularly on the second temptation and true worship. In that temptation, the devil tries to work out a treaty with Jesus. He says, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus responds, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. It is a refusal to compromise with evil that Jesus makes here. Um, Maybe you heard what the Ukrainian president said when the U.S. forces offered to bring him out of Ukraine. He responded, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. Uh, You can tell he's a good (laughs) public speaker. And he was not compromising, he was taking a principled stand. Now, Jesus certainly never uh, adopted or advocated the policy of fighting Rome. His his battle, as today's lesson makes clear, was uh, with a spiritual enemy, as is our real battle. But he did refuse to retreat or compromise with the devil. Jesus refused the devil's terms because worship belongs only to the Lord. But what exactly is worship? Um, Worship for many uh, Eastern religions, including Hinduism and some Buddhists, worship includes small burnt offerings to venerate uh, dead ancestors. Worship for Muslims requires praying at five specific times of the day, confessing Allah is the only God and Muhammad is his prophet, attempting to worship at Mecca at least once in your lifetime and giving 2.5% of your money to the poor and fasting during Ramadan. Worship means a little bit of different things to different people, but worship almost always includes giving honor and praise to something bigger than you, a greater cause, something more important than you. And just like with people, when you try to honor people, you do what they want. You don't necessarily do what you want. When when it's... uh, You don't go to your favorite restaurant on your spouse's birthday. You go to their favorite restaurant. Um, Well, that's too when we honor and worship the Lord. It's not like sometimes people have this idea, well, I'll do whatever I want or whatever I feel like. Well, you're supposed to be honoring the Lord, so you might want to do what he asks for. Well, even people who don't identify as religious might idolize a variety of things such as politics, their family, or a cause like environmentalism or as their grander purpose in life. Now, they give uh, financial support, maybe they go to rallies or, or workshops on these things and they sing the praises of their ideology or leader. They talk about it, they fight about it, they bend their lives around it. Now, they may not call it religion, but they treat it exactly like others treat religion. If you're a follower of Christ, though, only the true God deserves our worship. Other things, other people, other ideas may get our time, but they don't certainly deserve our worship. Unfortunately, there are times when you and I, too, make an idea or a person, or a desire more important than our Lord. It's not only people in other religions, we're guilty of it too. Our priorities, our vices, anything that we might obsess about are often simply idols, masquerading as something more respectable. However, none of these things is worthy of our worship. They will let us down or maybe even lead us down dark paths. They can't deliver us, and they will not be there to rescue us when we are in despair. However, our Lord will be there when we are desperate. Jesus is familiar with despair. 
He can sympathize with our pain, our suffering, and our hardship. He has endured pain, hardship, and suffering himself. In fact, when we go, well, we would go to almost any and every means to avoid suffering or pain, Jesus came to this world for that very purpose, to be rejected, to suffer, to be crucified, died, and buried. And that's why Jesus, Jesus alone is our true hope. Socialism cannot fix the world, nor can democracy or autocracy for that matter. Only Christ can transform our hearts from darkness to light. Only the word of God can make the, can, uh, make the blind see. Only the resurrected Christ can make the dead come alive. And that's why worship belongs to our Lord. He alone is worthy of our praise, because after all, he alone is God. He alone is mighty to save. It is he alone who has redeemed you from this world and from your own sin. And so, of course, we recognize that Jesus himself is central, indispensable to, Christian, to a Christian understanding of worship. And so if you worship God, but there is no Jesus, well, that's not Christian. One of the main reasons Luke includes this prologue to Jesus' ministry is that he's redefining what worship should look like. What should worship really be like? Well, he shows us what it means to be faithful, which is what God really wants from us. This is not a battle against flesh and blood. It's not a war on countries or individuals. It's a battle against the evil in all of us, including you and me. Luke clearly wants us to see Jesus' temptation as a redo of Israel's failed history, or we could say of history, a redo of history in general. How should we respond to temptation? When God made Israel his people, well, they were not very loyal. They complained, they rebelled, and they made compromises and worshipped idols as soon as it became convenient or attractive. And so the devil tried the same tactics on Jesus, the same tactics that so often are effective on you and me. First, he tempted Jesus by appealing to Jesus' desire to save his life or, or to give Jesus his wants or really his needs at this point, food. But Jesus says that more important than to life than even the most basic human needs is the word of God. In the third temptation, Jesus demonstrates that neither the temple nor God's word are tools that we can use to make God give us what we want. Um, in, a, in other words, God's gifts, like, like the temple or the scriptures, are not a lever we can use to control God. We can't make God do what we want by using his word or coming to worship or whatever. In, uh, and in the second temptation, which again is our focus for today, Jesus is offered power in this world. If you just compromise, I'll give you power over this world, the devil says. Serve me, and I'll serve you. Now, I don't know exactly, but I, when, I first, when, I first, when I was growing up, I always thought this temptation was kind of stupid, but... Uh, but I think that there, is, that there is something that the devil, there's something true about what the devil is offering Jesus. He's offering Jesus a, a road to victory without a fight. He's offering him a compromise. Um, now, maybe I'm a little bit cynical, but that sure sounds like a lot like much of politics or much of any ideology, uh, ideology ever created. It's, Sort of like uh, you scratch our back, we'll scratch yours. Get in bed with us, and we'll get you what you want. Look the other way, and we'll help you with what you need. But Jesus redefines what worship of the true God is truly about. It, like ancient Israel, we too often grumble when things don't go our way. We often rebel against God's plans and instead of following what he tells us to. 
We compromise to get power or gain control. However, Jesus trusts God's plan instead of trying to test him or make demands or compromises with his father. No, Jesus simply trusts his father even when he suffers, even when Jesus misses out. Well, what can we learn from the temptation of Jesus? First, well, you know, above and beyond all is that Christ gets us victory when we never could on our own. But beyond that, first, just because we hurt doesn't mean that we should sell our souls to get what we want. Boy, that would lose most of us Americans right away. Just because we hurt doesn't mean we should sell our souls to get what we want. Rather, we remember what Jesus said, that man does not live by bread alone. Second, which is really kind of the, the, third, the third commandment, I, because I'm focusing on the second one, the third temptation, buildings or blessings uh, are not the main focus of our worship. We should not try to test God. We should trust him. We should not try to manipulate him or barter with him saying, well, you said, or I did. No, we simply trust. Third, we don't maneuver to advance God's kingdom. Rather, we trust the Father's plan. And what is his plan? Well, his plan is salvation through Christ crucified, which means also that we rely on the examples, words, and passion of, our, of the Son and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So that's really our strategy. That's really how we will be saved. That's really our refuge, what Christ has done for us. And all of this reminds us that, of what the worship of Yahweh is really about. Even in the Old Testament, it was never about the building or the temple. It was never about the power or using God to get what the Israelites wanted. No, it's all about trust. It's about believing and acting as if God's plan is better, more reliable than your or my plan. True faith is continuing to trust our Lord even when we have cancer or lack food, or are in danger. True worship does not depend upon the building, or the preacher, or the music. It depends on God's plan of salvation, which means Christ's suffering, rejection, death, and resurrection, and sometimes even some suffering on our part. Reliance on God does not have to mean some big thing you do to prove it to God, like making a dramatic change, or trying a new diet, or, or any big action we think will impress others or get God's attention. No, reliance on God is simpler and less impressive. It simply means following Jesus' simple commands and trusting in the redemption he won us at Calvary. And of course, as we worship, worship involves you and your God. It means you and your Savior. Christian worship is acknowledging that Jesus has done it all for us, and that we simply praise and thank him for all that he has done, which is why we can sing with joy hymns of praise or, or songs to and about our, our great God. Christian worship involves confessing our sins, but not only confessing our sins, it involves receiving absolution, forgiveness, even for those times when we have failed to worship him as we ought to have. It means listening to what Jesus says and praying because Jesus listens to us. Above all, it means trusting in our Lord. Worship is daring to risk our lives, daring to make decisions based upon the simple, sometimes unimpressive promises and guidance of our Savior. We worship because of all that God has done for us in Christ Jesus and for the hope that he has given us. He is our God, and we are his people by faith in Christ through God's amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen.